We tend to think that intelligence is a reflected, conscious action which follows principles, the principles of logic. Often, however, we take decisions which are not depending on logic. We do have friends, we fall in love, we feel that share prices will rise. These are gut feelings. The question is, can they help us take better decisions? Seems to be naive, seems to be absurd to think so. Now, if you take a book about rational decision making, you normally read something very different or in an MA test you would find the same. The normal approach is consider all aspects, consider all implications, and then take a decision. Now, it sounds good, mathematically spoken and in theory, but it does not reflect how we take decisions or people take decisions who write these books. A professor at the Columbia University was invited to teach at Harvard, and he couldn't make up his mind. Should he stay? Should he go? Should he accept? Should he decline? And then a colleague asked him, what's your problem? I mean, why don't you go and maximize the use and benefit? That's what you write in your books. And the professor said, well, stop. It's serious. Now, may I invite you tonight to have a look at the world of decision making, conscious and unconscious or unconscious uh, decision making, decision making which is not based on logic. I will look at the secrets behind the decisions we take, and I will show you examples to show the relationship between gut decisions, a culture of errors, fear, uncertainty, and a hope that this might trigger ideas which you can use in your lives. Are you ready? Now, let's start our journey at the International Airport of Los Angeles. Dane Moran is a drug officer working there, a drug messenger arrives with a suitcase full of dollars, and he leaves a few hours later with a suitcase full of drugs. How can you identify a person amongst millions? One night, a plane from New York arrived. 200 people left, among them um, a woman with a black suitcase, most of us choose a black suitcase, suitcase, and when their eyes met, her eyes and Dane Moran's eyes, both knew what the business or the line of business of the other was. She was arrested, her suitcase was full of dollars, and she was punished. Now, I asked him, how did you know that it was her? He said, I, I can't explain it. I feel it. He could only tell me that he was looking for someone who was looking for him. And the woman also knew where the officer was to be found. Now, that's intuition. Intuition is felt knowledge, which reaches your awareness immediately he felt that something about her was wrong. And secondly, we don't know the reasons. Nevertheless, a lot of what we do and how we act in our private lives and professionally is being influenced by intuition. Now, Law-wise, there might be problems if someone is arrested for carrying drugs or arms 
and the um, officer says, well, I arrested this per person because I thought it might be him or her, the guilty one. Now, such a case would not be admitted by a law court. In other words, the law ignores one of the major capabilities we provide of. There were a number of trials which failed in spite of the fact that there were drugs or illegal weapons. Eventually, the investigators, the officers learned how to behave and they offered reasons for the particular case later. So this is not about a divine inspiration or a sixth sense. It's about intuition and intuition is what men and women have. Nevertheless, it's often used as an argument against women in order to say that women have no reason. So the first important differentiation we have to make is when should I trust my intuition and when is it worthwhile to have more data in order to double check and calculate. So this is not about your mind or your gut. You always need both. And here's the first answer. If you deal with risks you know, calculation, logics, statistics are sufficient. If you play games in a casino, you don't need intuition. You know quite well, and this can be calculated, what you will lose in the long run. Now, it's often said that banks play like casinos, but that's not true. They rather play in a world unknown where you need more than data. You need intuition and you need good heuristics, which is the scientific concept to describe the simple rules um, on which our action is based, our intuition is based. Now, first of all, a question to you. How often do you think that in listed companies, big corporations, important decisions are, after all, gut decisions? Let me give you an example from one of these corporations. And once, once again, this is not an arbitrary decision. It's normally rather that a person or a group is, so to speak, buried under a heap of data, but then he or she feels something. Now, what you see here is a survey, a poll actually, made in a corporation on different layers or levels, and the question was, how often do you take gut decisions? Uh, would you dare an estimate? Now here's what you get. There is none to say, I always take gut decisions, and that's reasonable. And if you look at the hierarchy, you realize that about half of all decisions taken are gut decisions in the end. Now, I, I guess, these people would never admit that they take gut decisions publicly, like the drug um, officer. I, I think there are two main reasons why people try to avoid gut decisions and how they proceed. I mean, how people proceed who take gut decisions. A, they give reasons afterwards. So one of the members of their team is asked to find good reasons, and these reasons are delivered ex post, so to speak, or you hire a consulting company, an agency that writes 200 pages in order to give the reasons, but both is a waste of time and money. However, people feel obliged to act this way because they are afraid to go and say, based on my experience, I think this is the way to go because if it comes to gut decisions, you have to adopt and assume responsibility, the responsibility for your decision. Secondly, gut decisions are what I call defensive decisions, which has an impact 
application for the company, meaning you think option A is the best one, but that's a gut feeling. And if it goes wrong, it's bad for me. So I rather opt for the second or third best option. And if it fails, I don't have to take the responsibility. So I try to avoid a gut decision. I try to protect myself um, at the expense of the company. How often do you think that decision makers in the same big corporations take defensive uh, decisions? And let me tell you, this uh, study was made by me, for me, um, by a person the company trusted. So what do you think? Now here, you see a different picture. Here you see people who say never. And that's probably the ideal manager you need. One of them said, well, if the company does well, I do well. And if the company suffers, I suffer. But then you also have those who say from 10, uh, well, actually, the 10 decisions I'm involved in are defensive decisions. And they argue that they might be punished if they make mistakes. There is no error or mistake culture in this company, so they just act according to the principle, cover my ass. Sorry. So one third up to one half of all decisions of the company, including board decisions, are dis defensive decisions. And actually, these decisions might cause damage to the company, but they protect the individual. And that's the reason why they are taken. Now, if a company goes and agrees to discuss this particular problem, it might gain a competitive edge because it's often a waste of money and time and energy if you take defensive decisions. But often defensive decisions are what you get in our societies. If you go to a doctor and assume that the doctor gives you the best possible advice, you're lucky because then your doctor is good. But many doctors carry out defensive medicine. In other words, they don't expect the best. But they expect and recommend the second or third best solution, which protects the doctor. You, you find it even more often in the United States because of the particular legal system. In a survey, more than 800 doctors, the high litigation uh, practices, gynecologists or surgeons who are often sued. Now, they were asked, do you do defensive medicine? How many of them, what percentage said, yes, we do? 93%. And that's probably a conservative estimate because there are still more who do it and they would not admit it, neither to you nor to themselves. And that's a problem because we are living in a society where people want to play it safe. They want to play it safe all the time. And this means a loss of quality in terms of the services and the products and what we can offer to others. The lack of a an era culture is a real problem. A friend of mine is a pilot working for Deutsche Lufthansa, and she's working on a study investigating the era culture of Deutsche Lufthansa and a German hospital. We know that commercial airlines have an era culture because near misses are being registered in a central agency in Munich and this is being communicated so that young pilots learn from the near misses. This does not happen in medicine, in the medical world, which means that up there in the air we are safe, but we are not safe here down on earth and not safe in hospitals. 25,000 people stab in Germany die on an average per year because of mistakes which could be avoided. They could be avoided by introducing checklists, for example. It's simple. Let's move on. How does intuition work? Now, here are several ways to slow down innovation. First, recommendation, mistrust. 
gut decisions. Second, demand rational reasons for each new idea. Three, create a security or double-check culture by taking defensive decisions. Unfortunately, this is happening in much too many companies, hospitals, and organizations. And in the sciences, by the way, the same is to be seen. Now, how does intuition work? What's the basis? Let me give you an example from the world of sports. Is anybody playing baseball here? Cricket? Football? Soccer? One of you. That's good. Now, assume you play a game, a ball flies towards you, an experienced player knows where to move. How? How does he know? Have you ever made an interview with a soccer player? I mean, these are useless interviews. Because the answer you get when you want to know how does he catch the ball is intuitive. I mean, it's the same intuition as the one we saw with the drug office. I know there are two theories. One says it's a complex problem. It requires a, a complex solution. Now, this is Richard Dawkins. I would like to quote him because he says somehow unconsciously you solve um, a mathematical calculation or a differential equation, and that predicts the trajectory of the ball. The question is, nevertheless, how does intuition work? Now, have you ever tried to calculate the trajectory? Now, this is the way you proceed. That's the way to calculate the trajectory, but it does not include um, spin or wind. That's the simple version, the simple equation. Now, how does intuition work with athletes in reali reality? It's very different from what Dawkins says. It's not about mathematics. It's um, about heuristics, and we call it visual heuristics. And it has three stages. Watch the ball start to run, and then adjust your speed so that your perspective remains stable. And that's what the athlete, this player does. He runs and... His speed is the right one, so he catches the ball in the end. And the player, the athlete, can ignore all the information you'd um, be able to calculate mathematically because the perspective is key here. The angle of vision and the solution is very different from the complex solution, and it's a successful one. There are many animals that proceed just this way if they try to catch something in the air or in water. They keep the perspective uh, stable. If you have a dog and if you throw a Frisbee disc, your dog won't calculate, won't consider an equation. It will run so that the visual angle remains stable. The same heuristics which are being used unconsciously, unaware, so to speak, can be used in order to help people take decisions better and faster. Do you remember the Hudson River miracle? An airplane? Um, started at um, LaGuardia Airport. And after a few minutes, there was a near collision with Canadian geese. Now, um, planes cannot digest, digest geese. And the problem was here that these geese hit the two turbines of the aircraft. The pilots decided to turn around, and they were not sure whether they'd make it up to the airport, whether they could reach the airport. How did they solve the problem? Did they calculate the trajectory with their computers and with formulas? No. They used the same heuristics as the one I've just described. You cannot really control much 
in such a case as far as the plane is concerned. So you look at the tower of the airport through the window, um, the windshield of your airplane, and if the tower rises, you won't make it. You will drop. And this happens quick, and it leaves not much time to do something different. And these are examples we use in order to find out how decisions can be taken intelligently, smartly, and quick. Now, let's move on, move on one more step forward. We talked about um, known risks and a world full of uncertainty, and the latter were examples of uncertainties. However, we live in a world in which we do not think about uncertainty much. Our economy assumes that the risks are known. Decision theory assumes that you can maximize your benefit if you can calculate probabilities. Now, we try to go a different way here in Berlin. We try to uh, find out how to deal with unknown risks in order to not mix up situations in which you cannot calculate the risk and in which you can calculate the risk. And if there is confusion, there is what I call the turkey illusion. Assume you are a turkey. Now, there is a man who comes and you think he will kill me, but he doesn't kill you. He feeds you, comes back next day, the man. And again, you fear he will kill me, but he feeds you. Same happens the third day. According to all mathematical probability theory models, with each day that passes, the probability that he will feed you and not kill you rises. But then after 100 days, Thanksgiving is, has come and he will kill you. So you were lacking an important information. That's the Turkey illusion. And I guess there are m much less turkeys affected by the Turkey illusion than human beings. Remember, the last economic crisis, and we are still suffering from it, one of the reasons was that they used mathematical models apt to calculate risk there where you know what the risk is, but you cannot use it in order to find out what the problem is if you don't know the risk. So they created an idea of um, certainty and security, but it was nothing but an illusion. Let me give you an example so that you see what a Turkey illusion is. And I would like to talk about the exchange rate. Big banks in Germany and all over the world tell us the exchange rate, euro and US dollar for the coming year. Some companies pay a lot of money for these forecasts, so this is bound to be good, right? Let me show you what it looks like, because I analyzed it. Now, here you see the exchange rate, one, two, one. If it uh, rises, the euro has a higher value than the dollar and vice versa. And all important companies of the world are included in the calculation. Now, on an average, it was one and one. That was what the Deutsche Bank said, for example. However, what was the real dollar exchange rate was lower than most people thought. It was only the Citibank or the Citigroup um, that thought the uh, rate would be different. And it was the last time the Citigroup was involved. Now, next year, we thought it would go down. However, the euro value went far beyond what we thought. So we thought it will rise, and the euro rose. Now, we went up again, the euro went up again in our estimates, that is, so 
three times beyond the overall forecast context. And here you see the strategies you pay for. Last year's trend is last year's trend, actually. It's as simple as that. Here you go up in your estimates, the euro falls, then you go up again, the euro falls again, then you go up and the euro goes up again, but still beyond your forecast, and then it goes down again, and then you have a hit for the first time, and so on and so forth. So I'm showing you this in order to help you understand that we live in a world in which we think we can calculate things which we cannot calculate. Often we deal with what we call big data, but we deal with a turkey illusion because we think our world can be predicted. It cannot. Now, why do people still make predictions? There are two reasons. A, you don't know that these predictions are bad and the banks don't publish them for good reasons. Or you know that the predictions are not reliable, actually, and nevertheless, there are the predictions being made and there are forecasts in order to um, sell responsibility in order to act defensively, in order to protect oneself. The manager who goes and makes a prediction and goes wrong can, can be blamed. However, if I go and buy the forecast, I, the manager, won't be blamed for an error. It will be Deutsche Bank that sold me the forecast. And again, a lot of time and energy is wasted in the process. These predictions, these forecasts are being made by smart young people. Actually, we need these people, these smart minds in the scientific context in academia. However, they are being paid for forecasts, for predictions, which are being paid for by executives, by managers of companies who try to avoid liability or responsibility. Let me give you another example. Once again, we are dealing with the Turkey illusion. This is about an investment. Assume you want to invest money and you don't want uh, and you want to diversify. How? Harry Markowitz of the University of Chicago got the Nobel Prize for the prize for the mean variance model. I mean, you might know the mathematical formula, which means that it's possible to maximize your gains in order to um, achieve a certain result, or you might also go and minimize the risk in order to get a better result. So Markowitz developed the mean variance model, and he received the Nobel Prize, and he used his own model in order to maximize his benefit, but he did not. He followed a simple intuition. And this rule is called one by and share your money in an equitable way between the n alternatives. You don't have to calculate anything at all. One divided by n, that's the simple approach. The interesting question is, is it good? Is this a good model? Many of my colleagues believe that Markowitz had a blackout. And in behavioral economics, you find lots of examples to show that people don't act according to the to the one divided by n approach. The true answer is Markowitz is right there where you can calculate the risk, but the world of finance is not a world where you can calculate the risk. And we made studies in order to find out whether his model truly works. Now, how do we proceed? In a study, we had seven different investment methods, like you have 10 U.S. industry funds. How do you share the money? Markowitz needs about 10 years in order to get all the data, in order to analyze them, in order to establish the model. In the end, you don't have to calculate much. You divide it by 10. Now, 
what was the result in the end. Wherever investment is concerned, at least in six of seven cases, the one divided by N solution was more profitable than Markowitz's approach. Now, when, why, and when we, the scholars working in this field, are interested in the answer to the question, when? When is it worthwhile and when is it not worthwhile? Now, you have three simple parameters. If there is high predictability, which is normally not the case as soon as you sell stock or shares, if N is small and if you have many data, make it complex. Then the mean variance is the right approach. Then big data is the best you can get. But if there is low predictability, if N is big and if you have few data, and this goes for many human decisions like which job should I take, who, whom should I marry, and so on. So if you don't have many data, make it simple. One divided by N. Now these are general principles. Now that's the important aspect to focus on. Does this does a bank understand this simple approach? Now, this is a letter I received from my internet bank. It was a letter sent to many uh, customers. Um, the title is Use the Strategies Developed by a Nobel Prize Winner in Order to um, Invest Successfully. And then in the letter, they asked me whether I know Harry uh, Markowitz. And if not, I should know him. And um, that's the way they try to sell their investment fund. Now, we analyze how many years you need in order to analyze the data in order to optimize. For example, if you have 50 options, 10 years were not enough. We need more, 12, 20 maybe, in order to optimize 500 years. You need 500 years of data, um, of share shares data in order to decide successfully on the basis of Mr. Markowitz's approach. So you have to wait 500 years. Nobody knows whether the stock exchange will still exist in 500 years. Definitely the DAB bank was too early when it came to sending the letter to all their clients. Now, there are three errors. One, and that's what you normally read in the books, David Carlemans and other Nobel Prize winners tend to underline that intuition is second class. Conscious considering is always better, they say, but this is a mistake. Intuition is not second class. Conscious considering is not always better. Secondly, complex problems always require complex solutions. Now, I gave you an example to show that complex problems often require simple solutions, which you can often deduce from intuitive decisions. And more information, calculation, and time are always better. That's the third error. But I gave you examples dealing with information and calculation. I also talked about time. Um, does someone play golf here? I mean, what, what are you doing? No sports, no golf? Now, here's an experiment. Beginners and experts talking about golf. Both groups have three seconds for the put. Three seconds. What happens with the beginners? If they have only three seconds, will they get better or worse? Better? Who thinks they will get better? Worse? None? Well, what do the others think? Well, it might be useful to use your mind. Beginners need time. If you play the piano, you have to exercise. Music only happens when you don't know what your fingers do anymore. But what happens to an expert who has only three seconds in order to put? Will they be better? Who thinks they will make it better? Who thinks they will fail? Well, we need a bit more exercise here. Interestingly enough, 
the experts will do better if they have only three seconds. Why? Because their knowledge is based on intuitive intelligence. It's, so to speak, in their gut. If they have too much time, they get nervous because ten thousands of people are watching them. So keep it short. If you have a meeting where you are an expert, um, keep it short. If you have beginners, take more time. So we will have to repeat it until everybody has understood it. Beginners and experts. Now, this time in our experiment, both groups will be told to watch closely what they do. What happens to a beginner if he or she watches closely what he or she does? Will he she do better? Right? Who thinks they will do worse? And you might ask your neighbor, beginners will do better if they take care, if they closely watch what they do. We have to learn it consciously. What about the experts? If they watch what they do, closely watch what they do, will they be better? None? Worse? Yes, right. Right you are, once again. There is a disturbance. They cannot focus anymore. I mean, you can use it strategically. Let's assume you play tennis and your opponent has a forehand and is very, very strong. Now, if you swap sides, you ask him, how do you manage? I mean, your forehand is so strong. How do you manage? And then the problem is solved for you because the opponent will think about it. So in summary, I have talked about how to deal with uncertainty. And I say that it's important to ignore part of the information in order to take good decisions. And that's um, about uncertainty. This is not yet about risk. Secondly, complex problems do not always require complex solutions. We have to ask questions. Are there simple solutions for a problem? Maybe there is no simple solution, but we have to ask, first of all, whether there is a simple solution. Three, positive error culture instead of being defensive and playing it safe. We have to make sure that we don't get hooked on a negative error culture. And we need to be brave, take gut decisions. And that's maybe important because it's about responsibility. If you want to know more and if you want to find more examples, you should bear in mind that more can be less, less can be more.